In a small town, the sky shines brightly, illuminating the night. Somewhere in the town, a girl is poking through trash bags. She wonders why someone would choose to throw trash near another person's house. Suddenly, she notices an injured man with blonde hair and immediately begins to poke him. She moves his head slightly to reveal his handsome face. Even injured, he still has charm and good looks. Suddenly, he makes weird sounds, causing her to stop. She stands up, realizing he's not dead. She thinks she has seen him somewhere before. The blonde, handsome, ruthless character, whom she refers to as Big Trash, was the protagonist of a novel, a romance thriller featuring the obsessive to death Lockyus Avalon. That was a story from a few years ago. Earlier in her life, she had been an orphan in the slums, kidnapped by terrible people who targeted orphans. A blonde girl had fallen and had been left behind by her friends, and she was taken by these people. Before she lost consciousness, she felt her head hurting and lose consciousness. Suddenly, she noticed the eyes in a jar and quickly woke up. Surrounded by doctors and nurses, she learned that she had been injected with an relic. They thought she had died, but all of the scientists believed there was nothing wrong with her dying, since she was just an orphan and no one would come looking. The scientists debated that it was a waste of a fragment. As she listened to their words, tears began to form in his eyes. The doctors wondered how long they would continue wasting fragments and if she was going to die like this. She was in so much pain that she thought death might be more comfortable. Suddenly, the doctors exclaimed at the magnificent sight before them. The girl was covered in spider webs. They wondered if it was finally a success. Not long after, she fell asleep in the cocoon. When she awoke, she was in an unknown place, feeling as if her entire body was being ripped apart. She looked around until she saw a giant monster with spiky legs, which caused a chill to crawl down her spine. She screamed in fear as the giant spider, covered in other spiders, approached her. She ran away, terrified. In her previous life, she had not been an orphan. She had been an average girl with an average family. She remembered reading a book called A Chain of Flowers, which she had read ten times. The heroine was her favorite character. In her past life, she had died at the hands of Trunk Kuin, and she couldn't believe it. Suddenly, she began to wake up and heard the voices of the doctors explaining that it was a success and that the experiment had finally worked. Her hair was no longer blonde but black. She tore open the cocoon only to be surrounded by doctors. It felt like she had only spent a little time inside, but in reality, she had been asleep for three years. The fragments injected into her body gave her strange powers, including the ability to control webs and heighten sensitivity, but also took away her emotions. The doctors questioned her about her condition and how she was feeling. Reflecting on their questions, she remembered that she had initially died after being hit by a truck and then had been subjected to human testing. Strangely, she felt nothing. She used her new powers to grab an iron pipe and break it, causing steam to release and distracting one of the doctors. She immediately took the opportunity to escape, but a doctor exclaimed that she was an arachne and they had to catch her. They threw a net at her, and unfortunately, it worked. She was caught, and despite several attempts to escape, she was unsuccessful each time. One day, the doctor remarked that Arachne had been getting stronger and that they needed to find a way to isolate her. She also noticed that security was getting tighter. She didn't have much time now. However, her thoughts were interrupted by a huge explosion. An intruder had arrived. This was her chance to escape. As she ran down the hall, she believed the entrance was near. Suddenly, she encountered doctors and wondered why they were crowded together. The doctors commented that they couldn't believe the intruder was Lukia and that they needed to inform the warden. At that moment, a man with deadly intent approached, stating that they had hurt so many innocent children. Even she, who had become emotionally numb, felt a deep instinctive fear. If she confronted him now, she would lose her life. Lukia questioned why they were huddled together like cockroaches, commenting that it was disgusting. She quickly realized that she had heard that name before. It was a name she read in the novel The Flower Series. She questioned what kind of world this was. The Flower Series was a novel she had enjoyed reading in her past life. 
Lockyer's Avalon was the dark side of the novel. Lockyer's informed the doctors that starting today, the laboratory would be closed. However, a very bold and brave doctor took a knife and lunged toward him, exclaiming who cares. Lockyer's smiled confidently at him. It was said that this laboratory was destroyed and disappeared, and everyone working in the laboratory lost their lives. She was reincarnated as an additional character not even mentioned in the novel, destined to die at the hands of that man, just like the doctor who had been so bold earlier. Fortunately, she took advantage of the chaos and barely managed to escape from the laboratory. She thought that this was not a good idea. Once more, he was trash that couldn't even be recycled. Even thinking back on it, she wondered what would have happened if she had been caught at that time. If she had been reincarnated as a noble's daughter instead of this girl, it would have been nice. Even if she became the heroine of the novel, she would have been bullied by this man. The female heroine in the Flower series is the daughter of a rich man, but her father disappears in a car accident. This is how she falls into ruin and is pursued by debt collectors. Even though it was a difficult situation, she overcomes adversity with a bright attitude and kindness throughout. In the end, she thought she would find love and have a happy ending, unless this person causes everything to end in blood. As expected, this man was the problem. He was a human butcher who randomly destroyed people's lives around him. One of the people he got rid of was a minor hero loved by readers, who was also her favorite character. This man changes the atmosphere with his mere presence. If he knew she was participating in the testing from the lab, he would never let her live. Her intuition was different from the time when she was helplessly holding her breath. Fortunately, this man was unconscious now, and if she didn't want to get hurt, this was her only chance. As he lay there unconscious, she told him goodbye. Suddenly, the door began to open, and she panicked. She immediately kicked him away and treated him like a trash can. Suddenly, a girl with white hair approached her, exclaiming, Lady Nara! She introduced herself as Anna Marie. Marie said she came out because she heard footsteps. She then thought that Lockyus wasn't chasing her, the experiment subject. He must be after Anna Marie as it was just following the storyline. Five months ago, Anna Marie had moved to the house next door. She had come to introduce herself as the new neighbor. She informed Nara that she had moved several times. Unfortunately, there was no one around her who was her age so she was pleased to see a woman her age living next door. She introduced her younger sister, Hestia. Nara quickly realized this was indeed Anna Marie, the main character of the novel. She wondered why Anna Marie had moved next to her. Perhaps she had left the house in the novel. Nara stared off into space with many questions. However, Marie looked at her with a pleasant smile. Anna Marie had originally been unlucky. She saved Lockyer's, who had fallen in front of her house and got involved with him. Lockyer's, obsessed with Anna Marie, destroyed anyone who tried to harm her even slightly, taking their lives. By the latter half of the novel, Anna Marie regretted saving Lockyer's. Nara had been trying to avoid being around Anna Marie, but Anna Marie had heard from another neighbor that Anna Nara worked at the largest cafe in the area. Nara questioned, So what? Marie immediately apologized saying she was sorry for asking such a personal question when they first met. She planned to work at the treatment center across from the coffee shop, which was close to her house and convenient in her opinion. Marie made a sad face as if she were a puppy being scolded. Nara told her that since she would be working at the treatment center, she would come to see her often, which made Marie smile. Nara had agreed because Marie seemed nice. Nara reflected that in the novel, they said they were moving into a ridiculously shabby house. That was definitely not the case here, as this old house was so familiar to her. But in rich people's minds, it was a dilapidated house. Suddenly, Marie questioned if Nara had had dinner. She has a late dinner with Hestia now, but if she hasn't eaten yet, maybe she would like to eat with them. Nora explained that it's a pity, but she already ate. She seems a bit disappointed but comments that she's glad she had her dinner on time. Suddenly, Marie hears a strange sound. Nora comments that it sounds like something is broken, so Marie should go inside. They wave goodbye, and Anna Marie tells her to have a good evening. She wonders what will happen to the main villain who came to the wrong house. 
According to the original work, Lachius collapsed in front of the neighboring house, and Anna Marie had to rescue him. She thought it would be better to follow the original version from now on. She contemplates if it wasn't good for the future. She becomes serious, her eyes red, and forms something with spiderwebs. She thinks that she has to make him meet Anne Marie. She hopes that Marie won't blame her. After all, she's just an extra girl actor who has nothing to do with this. This is only another story and it's the right development. Suddenly, Marie opens the door and calls for her. She quickly closes her hand and wonders what's next this time. Marie brings her cookies shaped in her image. Nora is surprised, wondering what it could be. Marie smiles and states that it's a cake she cooked with Hestia. She heard they often serve dessert. She hands Nora the cookies, and Nora remembers her dog she had before, a cute white dog named Coco. Marie reminds her of her dog Coco. She slightly blushes and tells her that she'll eat it well. Suddenly, in a stern tone, she informs Marie not to come out at such late hours just because she heard someone outside, because it's not exactly a safe place at night. Marie responds that the footsteps sounded like hers. Nora didn't respond, but someone could imitate her footsteps intentionally. However, Marie questions if there could be such a person. Nora, knowing that under the carriage is an unconscious person, tells Marie that she'll never know what will happen, so she should be careful. Marie walks back to her house, stating that she'll be careful and thanks Nora for caring. When Marie leaves, Nora looks at the cookies with a saddened expression. If she leaves them in front of Anna Marie's house like this, a bloody interesting story will begin, right? What would be the heroine's crime? Lachius is excessively obsessed with Marie. He has eliminated everyone around her and plans to kidnap and imprison her. So he even plans to eliminate this cute little girl. That guy's a monster. I wish he wasn't the main male lead. Someone needs to get rid of him quickly. She can't let that happen, not this time and not like this. However, she can help him. This means the villain will be attached to her. Later, we see the villain with his blood-stained clothes on her couch. She stares at his wounded shirt and wonders if it's because she kicked his wound too hard. Looking at the wound, she seemed to have hit a critical area. Not even and Marie could heal it. Most people who are exposed to relics experience side effects. However, Anna Marie did not die. It appeared that she had the power of healing, although it is essentially a power derived from relics. She, who was forcibly experimented on and injected with power, awakened on her own and gained powers. She has a different personality. Compared to Anna Marie who gained her powers normally and not by force, Lachius, who hated test subjects, was even more obsessed with Anna Marie. Suddenly, she uses her web to rip off his shirt, revealing scars and wounds. However, I have to admit he has a very, very well-built body. She begins to treat his wounds without anesthetics, and he is in a bit of pain. The one who got some help from her is the main villain, not the heroine, but it's impossible for him to fall in love with her just because she helped him. After she finishes treating his wound, she decides to begin the surgery. Using her webs, she begins to sew his wounds together, quickly suturing them. Now she has to get some medicine from Anna Marie tomorrow. In the next scene, we see the men and women enchanted by a beautiful waitress with such amazing eyes that seem to take away your soul. They wonder who she is and comment on her beauty. She goes to get some lemonade from the fridge and thinks that she shouldn't come to this part of the area. The great nobles divide the region into east, west, south, and north. Where she is now is an area ruled by the family of the male protagonist, Kelly and Crokeford. Since it's the main stage, here are the other characters. The East can enjoy some modern artifacts now. This is because of someone who is one of the leading nobles of the East and the second hero of the novel. He is an excellent alchemist and was able to develop advanced tools, such as using electricity instead of candles, as well as a gas-powered freezer to keep food fresh. Only Eastern alchemists could make such tools. However, these tools are not marketed in other regions. Even if she didn't expect this place, suddenly her boss seems to notice something off and calls for her. She turns her head and exclaims yes with an exhausted expression. He comments that she seems to be a little tired, as after she arrived, there were many customers. But if the work is too exhausting, he can hire someone else. She smiles, 
stating that she's fine. She just couldn't sleep well. However, her beautiful sleep was shattered in less than a day because of a certain person. At that moment, Anna Marie enters her workplace with a smile and calls for her. Nora greets her and asks her to take a seat. She inquires if she wants coffee, as she was about to take her break. Marie says that, of course, she wants coffee. She informs Nora that she came to bring what she asked for. Nora thanks her, as she was thinking of stopping by her workplace before she got home. She inquires about the cost of the medicine. However, Anna Marie tells her that she doesn't need to pay for it. Anna Marie approves of the coffee and it smells delicious. She smiles and informs her that it also tastes delicious. As these two talk, they seem like two models having a discussion. Because as they speak, the boys and even the girls are enchanted. Anna Marie then reveal that today she's leaving early from work. If it doesn't bother her, they can walk home together. However, Nora states that she won't be able to as she has a matter to attend to. Anna Marie lowers her head, thinking it's saddening. But she is sure that on another occasion, they can go home together. They wave goodbye as Anna Marie goes back to work. Suddenly, Nora quickly turns around as she notices a butterfly with golden wings. The butterfly flew into the air, and from it came out not just any note but a request. She informs her boss that she will be leaving, and her boss tells her to be careful. She works in the cafeteria from morning until sunset, but when night comes, she receives requests from different people. She uses her powers to take out different people and do her work. She didn't want to have the skill, but since she has it, she thought it would be a waste not to use it. It's a good way to earn a living. She enters a dangerous place with dangerous men who question who she is as they hold weapons in their hands. She tells them her name is Matilda. She approaches them looking seductive as hell. That smile. Oh my goodness, it's amazing. I would put a ring on that right now. She finishes her work with only screams filling the air. She wonders if it's because Anna Marie looks like Coco. Maybe she should go somewhere else. She questions how much a house like this would cost. As she sits on one of the criminals, he tries to scream for help, but his face and body are covered in spiderwebs. Having a house like this is her dream. She tells the men that if they had listened to her when she warned them before, they wouldn't be in this situation. The man seems ready to cry as tears form in his eyes. She cuts the web with a smirk on her face questioning if they're done with this. He then scream. However, she holds the web and tells him not to worry. It's only a 10-meter drop, and she doesn't believe he'll die from it. However, he swings as if that's going to stop him from falling. It seems he has been a genius. As his mouth is free from the web, he states that he'll do whatever she asks of him. She questions if he's telling the truth, but if that's the case, she wants to know the whereabouts of the documents. He quickly tells her where they are. She smiles and thanks him. She cuts the web and he falls screaming, but luckily, she catches him in midair, and he seems to be unconscious from the shock. She walks away into the sunset. The customer had said he would take care of it. It's now late at night, and the sky is filled with beautiful stars. However, she does not want to go home. She doesn't care if he opens his eyes or not. She thinks she should have let him die. She slowly opens the door with a very unhappy expression. She sees that he's still sound asleep. She questions whether, since he's the villain, he won't die. As she approaches him, he suddenly grabs her arm, shocking her. He pulls her closer, staring into her eyes with a seemingly scared expression. She's surprised that he's awake and stares back at him. Earlier, it had been late, the streets were empty, and he was wounded with heavy breathing. He had held his wound as he slowly bled out, hearing a lot of strange noises. Exhausted, he fell against the wall, thinking that if he could rest a little, he would be okay. Suddenly, she noticed that his eyes were open, but he wasn't truly awake. He had just opened his eyes reflexively. She pried her arm from his grip and told him to relax and lie down and sleep longer. For now, no one is threatening him. He falls back asleep, and she looks at her hand, which is bruised. She tells herself that as long as he's ignorant of everything, there will be no problem. She was able to heal him, but he opened his wounds again due to his damn reflective abilities. The next day, she opens the window, 
but she couldn't sleep because of the danger to her life. At that moment, he opens his eyes and looks at the light from the window. She questions if he's awake and inquires how he feels. He is amazed by her beauty, and it seems like time stops as he looks at her. She is confused by his reaction, noticing that even his expression has changed. She tells him not to wake up suddenly like he did last night because he might hurt himself. He attempts to speak but feels a lot of pain when he tries. She tells him it will be difficult to say anything due to the serious neck injury he sustained. She's unsure if he will remember the two days ago when he got injured and was unconscious in front of her house, which is why she brought him here. He looks at her with strange, unreadable eyes, and she wonders why he's looking at her and if he hasn't let his guard down yet. She states that he may have more questions, but she has to go to work now. Anything he needs will be on the table, and he should feel free to use it. If he wants to see more, he can do so, but if he wants to leave, he can do that too. She will be leaving now. As she walks out, she thinks it would be better if he disappeared completely. When she closes the door behind her, he seems confused and questions if she is really leaving him alone in her house, a man she has never met before. He is also puzzled, unsure if she is sweet or cold-hearted. Suddenly, he hears a voice questioning if he is alive and if he is listening. Lockhues tells him if he wants to continue like this, it's better to do it later as his ears hurt. Shadow questions how Lockhues can talk like that to another person, but Lockhues questions when has he been a person. Shadow asks if that matters now. He thought he was going to die this time. Lockhues questions how he feels. Lockhues tells him that his head hurts, and Shadow questions if he is not aware that if he dies, it will die too, so he must be careful. But Lockhues doesn't see what's so great about it. The person he trusted most in the world stabbed him in the back. Shadow questions how many times he has told him that he's an idiot, doesn't see things clearly, and shouldn't trust anyone. Lockhues responds that he thinks Shadow right. Lockhues is thought that everything was gone and the laboratory was destroyed. When he offered to help, he just wanted him to accept. It's disgusting to think about, so he tells Shadow not to mention it again. Shadow questions if Lockhues was mesmerized when he saw the woman, noting that his heart rate went crazy. Shadow asks if she is his type. Suddenly, he begins to blush. Shadow is happy, stating that he's not saying no. He's a man after all, so he must have been excited. Lockhues then gets up very angry. But when he does, he begins to open his wound, which Shadow quickly informs him of. Meanwhile, Nora notices that someone has been following her since she left her home. She pretends not to notice. But when she stops, she realizes he was following her on purpose. She quickly walks away, thinking it's annoying. She turns the corner into an alleyway, and not long after, he follows her, looking around. However, it's a dead-end street, and he notices he has lost her. But that's not the case, as this was an ambush. She uses her web to capture him, apologizes, and declares she'll deal with him later that day because she is very tired. Unknown to her, a bird was watching her. In the original novel, he was treated by Anne-Marie. She introduced herself and treated him delicately. But when she asked for his name, he pushed her hand away with the bandage because he had to ask for his name. She stared at him in shock. He smirks and tells her that she just wrapped a piece of bandage around him and thinks she's done him a favor. He questions if she thinks he saved her and grabs her neck, stating that she thinks too much. No matter how it looks, it wouldn't be a problem to erase her from the world. As he says this, she trembles. This is what was in the novel. Covered in blood, his clothes ripped off and lying on her couch. The Lord of Darkness is a disaster. Since he arrived, he has not awakened except for the one time he did earlier. She notices he is moving a lot on his panting heavily. She places her hand on his forehead, thinking that when she saw him in the morning, he looked very good. Suddenly, she begins to shake him, telling him to wake up. She notices that he seems to be recovering faster than she thought. She can't believe he healed so quickly with the naked eye in just two days. He is the meaning of the novel. Maybe she shouldn't categorize him as an ordinary person. Maybe he had absorbed fragments of relics. However, she doesn't remember seeing such an explanation in the novel. But if someone thinks about it, Lockhues came to destroy the laboratory directly. It's an unreliable story, 
as if a change had been made. There's no guarantee that everything will end like the novel, but what does that have to do with her? In fact, he's lucky he didn't die. Because of her previous job, she had to buy many clothes. She wonders if it will be enough. If Lockyer survives, it would be great. His blood has dried up, and it would be nice to get a chunk of money as a reward. But that's only if Lockyer doesn't rip her head off first. Suddenly, Lockyer wakes up. When he gets up, feeling pain at his side, he sees her lying by his bedside. He questions why and where he is, but he then sees her, laying next to him sound asleep. He slowly approaches her with his hand. Her spider senses kick in, and she realizes someone is trying to touch her. At that moment, his finger touches hers. Something strange happens when she touches his hand. She feels an unknown emotion. The lab had taken all of this from her, but it's a beautiful feeling she hasn't felt in a long time. His face turns red, and he questions what this is. He can't control it. Maybe Seal did it. He can't take it anymore and withdraws his hand from her. Suddenly, she grabs his hand, not wanting him to let her go. He slowly takes her hand away. She exclaims no, hitting the table and causing a glass of water to fall on the ground and shatter. She falls on top of him, entwining their hands. He looks like someone being seduced. She thinks she's doomed. Last night, while she was taking care of Lockyer's, she fell asleep. She felt like someone was touching her head, so she pushed him away. Now she has ended up like this. She can't understand why she can't stay away from Lockyer's. He blushes and requests that she get off him. Her face turns red, and she wishes she weren't here. She gets off him, apologizing repeatedly. She regrets getting closer and thinks it was a very strange feeling. What was happening to her? It doesn't matter. She apologizes for being rude. She did not mean to do that. Suddenly, he feels pain in his neck and turns his head from side to side searching for something. He then sees a book, paper, or pen. He starts to write, stating it's okay and thanking her for her help. She declares that she's just doing her duty, as she was also helped by some other neighbor. He is enchanted and questions what neighbors. He admits he's embarrassed as he hasn't recovered yet, but can he stay for a few more days? His eyes are as innocent as a child, and she thinks that if she had been asked, she should have flatly said no. But when she held his hand, a strange phenomenon happened. She needs to know what happened. She declares that if he's not feeling well, he can stay and rest. 